So um, want to do this AI stuff? Yeah, quickly. We can't get out of here without talking about semis. So semis are now 10.7% of the S&P 500, down from a peak of 12.6% as the market went higher, mind you, by the way. Um, and it's this is not uh, this is not phony manipulation. There's 7.5% of net income of the S&P 500, up from uh, I don't know 4% before before this AI wave came. Like profits are driving them higher. They're a bigger percent of market cap. They're a bigger percent of the overall profit corporate profits. You can't extrapolate this this kind of thing out forever. Is it overdone already? Well. I would say almost in my mind, I think the semiconductor intensity of everything we buy is going up. Yeah. So I, I everything always- Everything has a chip in it. Yeah, everything has a chip. Yeah. It may not be an, a, an NVIDIA chip, but it has a chip. And uh, I would say to me, that's been observable from early on. And, and now that we're more of a digital economy, it makes more sense. You know, more of our GDP growth is also native digital as well. So One, given that you think that technology is going to become, you say likely become- 50% of S&P 500. I'm guessing you think that AI will not will not be a bust. That's right. I think AI is uh What's in this this is there's a lot there's a lot going on here. Yeah, this okay. is a multi-layered chart. Okay. Um the top half of this chart which looks like waves is the measure of the gap between the number of prime age workers or sorry, total working age population total working age population versus people. So like when this wave is positive, that means you have a shortage of workers relative to the total population. Okay, got it. And then uh, you'd think, what what do companies do when you have labor shortage? You have Spend to invest in tech. automation. Yeah, so yes. then the bottom chart is tech's price ratio to the S&P, and it's gone parabolic every time. There's so shortage. every time there's a prolonged labor shortage, which I think we just lived through, the result is that companies invest more in tech. Yeah, because otherwise you have inflation. Well, oh we just had like the mother of all prolonged inflation issues and labor shortages yeah. outside of the 70s. Yeah. So it would stand to reason companies are taking a lot of meetings now about how do we make sure this never happens again? That's right. And then okay. a second overlay on, on top of this is that this, the global labor shortage is even bigger. Yeah. And the US is the primary supplier of technology Re worker replacement. So I have a whole chapter in my new book and the chapter is called Just Own the Damn Robots. I still think that's like the most obvious investment thesis that exists. I don't know which stock at any given time, but like it just seems the tailwind there is permanent. Yeah. Okay. Like it, it might have a couple of down quarters like in 2022, but like bigger picture, there is no company in America that's like, how could we spend less on tech? So BlackRock yeah. is preparing to launch, this is from the journal, a, a more than $30 billion AI investment fund, $30 billion with Microsoft to build data centers and energy projects to meet growing demands stemming from AI. Wow. Yeah. And that's probably not enough money, right? Because I think open AI's CapEx is like $50 billion Well, the there's years. a debate internally at um, at Goldman Sachs. You probably read the article this week. Uh, it was in the New York Times. They have an analyst named Jim Covington, and he says it. I was scarred by the dot-com bust. He was like a 22-year-old, got his first analyst job at Goldman Sachs, and they laid off his whole group within a couple of years. So I think he's acknowledging that he looks at things through that prism, but he's basically saying any time in history where we build too much of something that no one really needs, it ends up being not great. And he's seeing the same parallels now. He's basically saying, I don't see where the ROI is on a trillion dollars in spending. Um, so Goldman very wisely... They have some really bullish people on AI there too, which of course they do. They turned it into content. They had their biggest AI bull debate this guy, their biggest AI skeptic, and they invited an audience. So this is the biggest investment bank in the world. Not sure whether or not AI is .com 2.0 or something different. So I think it's hard for everyone to understand, like, did we bid these stocks up too much or maybe are we underestimating I mean, OpenAI is what, 100? What did they raise at 100? Is it 150? Yeah, yeah, I mean, these are, so, right. And 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 now they're going to be full-blown for-profit. They're not going to pretend that yeah. they're doing charity work. Uh, but how, like, how do you know that this AI thing isn't setting us up for the, even though the internet turned out to be real, it also turned out to be a lot of wasteful investment leading up to it. How do you like, how could you really be sure that we're not doing the same thing again. Um, we we don't right without 
perfect foresight. But I think Covington should review those interviews in the 80s where people debated the personal computer, and it was the experts that dismissed the future of personal computing. Okay, so there's been skeptics for every technology wave. Yeah. Okay. He could also be right. He could be right and then wrong long term. That's another yeah. possibility. So. And, yeah, and one thing that people haven't studied is after the dot-com bust of 99, the biggest stock winners were the dot-com stocks. You know, the, like— The ones that survived. <laughs> yeah, because once—see, when when fiber prices collapsed, that yeah. opened the world for Priceline, eBay, social media, and the, and the structure was very mm-hmm. favorable. There was no reciprocal termination, so Netflix could broadcast without paying— for carriage on right, the internet. Right, but what you had to know in 99 was buy Priceline, don't buy eToys. Like, like because they weren't both going to make it. Yeah. Okay. Or, or, like, let's say that there is an AI crash, and so the price of AI computing crashes. Who wins when the price of computing drops? And maybe it's exactly what you said. It's all the companies that use it. Meta. Yeah. Well, so, right. So the GPU salespeople don't win per se, if the price of, of GPUs drops because of falling yeah. demand, but maybe the end users benefit. Yeah. Okay. You, you know, like who benefits from a PhD level employee that now you can rent for one-tenth the cost, you know? Hello, everybody. That was Tom Lee and Josh Brown discussing artificial intelligence and very interesting discussion. Thought that I would now take a quick look at the technicals to look at SMH in particular. We're going to look at semiconductor ETF in just a few moments to see how the semiconductor space is looking technically, currently, um, at the end of the month. Today, uh, it's Sunday, September 29th, as I'm recording this video. Now, in the prior video, I did go over the indices and and some ETFs, including the small caps and mid caps, so you may want to check that out. That was on Friday that I did that video. I also discussed these stocks right here. And today, we'll go into the sectors. We'll go into, we'll look at Google and Apple, and we'll also look at a, a number of stocks and ETFs here in the uh, member requests. First, before we get started, let's take a look and see uh, the, you know, basically the one week performance. You can see here what sectors did well. And this was Friday. Energy, utilities, communication services were up. Technology, basic materials were down. Uh, but for the one week performance, um, basic materials, consumer cyclical, industrial technology did well. And energy, healthcare were the laggards. Here's the one month performance. So now we're getting into the end of the month. You can see energy and healthcare did not do that great. We'll look at those, of course, in a few seconds. Okay, so let's take a look actually right now. Um, Start off with XLB, since they're all sort of um, in this uh, order here. XLB, we're looking at a weekly chart. This week broke through the 9442 level looking very bullish for and for the materials ETF on the daily chart also looking still strong We're, we have price above the Tenkinson we have it above the Kijinson and the Ichimoku cloud that's what you want to see we have the Chiku span here above the price that's another uh, positive element that's part of the Ichimoku indicator uh, so everything looks very really bullish. The only negative, I suppose, is that the candle itself is slightly negative. You can see a long wick at the top. It shows basically that there was a, little, a bit of selling taking place in the later part of the day. So here's a five-minute chart that represents that. Okay. So here we were on the 27th. It popped up, and then it started to decline towards the end of the day. All right. Let's take a look at XLC next. That's communication services. Here's the daily chart. Very bullish. Everything looks good here in order. Same thing on the weekly, breaking through for a second week above the 8802 level. I like it. IBIT, this is the Bitcoin ETF, okay? Uh, Recently broke through this 3644, this Friday actually, and during the week broke through and closed above that level of resistance. It is above the moving averages and the cloud, so that's bullish on the weekly. On the daily chart, same thing. Again, getting a, a little bit of a reversal candle here. They call that a gravestone candle pattern. Um, When you see a flat body like that at the bottom and the wick at the top. Uh, So, you know, this could lead to a potential little pullback maybe to the 3644, maybe even down to the Tengensen going into next week. But, you know, again, I would be watching the highs and the lows of this candle to see where it goes. 
All right, now, SMH, semiconductors, how are they doing? Well, if we look at the weekly chart, okay, uh, this uh, 255.56 level is based on these two candles right here. You can see that in the past, it found support here two weeks in a row. Once it closed under that level, the 255.56 level, uh, it came back up, found resistance there, dropped. This week, it came back to that 255.56 level and dropped a little bit. Here's the daily chart. You can see how it's hit its head right at that level. So that is concerning, basically, and I would not um, be entering a long position here based on that. That's a profit-taking location, basically, all right? And so there were a lot of sellers waiting to get in here to like to either take profits or maybe even short it, you know, at least temporarily. Um, but overall, as far as the indicator is concerned, we are now in bullish territory. We have price above the cloud and the Tengensen and Kajensen. A lot of you people may not be familiar with this indicator. It's a Japanese indicator originally incepted in the late 1930s. It became published in the late 1960s in Japan and has been used by financial institutions for, you know, since, you know, they existed, basically. Especially, they, they all started in Japan, and then they, they, they brought this indicator here to the United States in the 80s and started using it more in um, some of the largest financial institutions, including Fundstrat uh, uses. I know that their technical charting person, I forget his name, but his he's the head of um, technical strategy at Fundstrat. He uses Ichimoku. Um, so anyway, I like it. It's very easy to identify uptrends and support levels, and it will help with entry and exits as well. A lot of, it's a comprehensive indicator. Let's look at COPX. Now this one, this is Copper Miners ETF. Here's the weekly chart. You can see where it stopped back See that pivot candle right there? For 48.57, it retracted from that level immediately. So it hit that level on Thursday, September 26th. And then on Friday, we got that spinning top. And that's a negative candle, a reversal candle. When you see it this far away, also from the Tenkinson and Kijinson, those two support, you know, these support levels, uh, it's more than likely to pull back a little bit. Now, if it breaks through, that's another point. That's another another thing we'll see um, but i would be very cautious here i'd be watching the lows here of these two candles if you happen to be holding it uh, because if it drops under that level this low it should it more than likely will come back down to the tangenson silver is uh, also reached a level of resistance here 29.56 and retracted down to 28 in fact it closed under 28.94 on on friday you can see that there on the weekly chart, you can see it's where it's hitting its head. So this is profit-taking place. If it gets above 29.56, I'll, I'm bullish again. How about gold? Gold, on the other hand, look at this on the weekly chart. Very bullish chart, moving up with a lot of strength here. On, on Friday, on the daily chart, however, it did pull back a little bit, down 0.79%, but still very bullish territory for gold. All right, let's keep going here. We got XHB. This is the Home Builders ETF. This one did really well. It was up 1.49% on Friday. You can see that on the daily chart here. And um, so it, found, it came down, found support, and popped. High volume. I like it. How about the weekly chart? 121.23 is the support level that it needs to stay above, in my opinion, to continue this run. TIP is the Treasury Inflation Protection. That one hit its head right there at 111.26. On the weekly chart, pulled back a little bit, um, as you can see, and it's under the tangents in here. But overall, it's in pretty bullish territory. It just needs to get above that green line. By the way, that green line, just for those of you who aren't familiar with what these lines mean, um, this green line is the midpoint. So it represents the midpoint of each of the very last nine periods or candles. In this case, it's the last nine days. Okay, and the red line represents the last, the midpoint of each of the last 26 periods. So it's not based on closing prices like most moving averages. It's the midpoint, which makes it interesting. And then the cloud itself is derived by taking the midpoint of the two moving averages. So there's the Tenkinson and Kijinson. If you take the midpoint here, project it 26 periods into the future, that's where you'll find the Synchrospan A. 
and you want that to be above the Senku Span B, this purple line. The purple line is the midpoint of the, each and every one of the last 52 periods, okay? And it's plotted right there. And then this white line that you see right here, which is another part of the uh, cloud or an Ichimoku indicator, is the closing prices, but it's reflected, and it's in a line form as you can see here, but it's reflected 26 periods into the past. So here's the closing price right here. We go back 26 periods, that's where you'll find the Chigu span. Why is that important? Because you want to see where the price is today in comparison to where it was 26 periods ago. If it's above, that means that you're in an uptrend. If you see that the white, white line is under, as it was back here, then you hold off on entry of the stock or ETF. Does that make sense? So that's the way to read this. And you only want to enter long positions. Another part of it, the rules here are you only want to enter a long position when price is above the cloud, okay? Above the moving averages, all right? You never want to enter when it's inside the cloud, okay, like it was here, or under the cloud, unless you're shorting, considering a short position when it gets under the, clo the cloud itself. All right, let's look at XLRE real estate. It's been holding under. You can see the resistance that it's finding right there on the daily chart under the Tengensen, so I'd hold off on this one. But overall, again, even real estate has been had a nice run, but just recently you can see that it's declining a little bit. Here's the weekly chart. So it found resistance here at 45.87 and, and pulled back a bit this week. Um, XLY is consumer discretionary. That one's popping above the 194.79 level. That looks very strong. Here's the daily chart, still moving up. Yes, we have a few red candles, but we're above the moving averages, so that's good. Utilities is looking good on the daily. Here's the weekly, very strong, right? What is this down here? This is the directional movement index, and this represents the trend, essentially. So directional movement, right? Direction. What direction is this in? Well, if the green line is above the red line, it's in a bullish state. And when you see that ADX moving up like it is right here that means that there's momentum coming in so this i use utilize this indicator in addition to the ichimoku so that i can identify just to get a little more confirmation that the stock is in fact entering a uh, a higher momentum state right like it is right there which leads to typically to move up now uh on the inverse side of that however if you notice, um, let's go back in the past and try to find a downtrend so I can show you how that would have been very useful to know, to, to use this indicator. Here, for example, price got under the Tengensen and Kijensen, right? If you look down below, you'll notice that the red line crossed above the green line immediately. It was a big jump. It was a big candle. Uh, and then what happened? The white line, all right, it started moving up. So the momentum was to the downside here, right there, and it dropped further. And so, it, you know, it can help keep you out of bad trades. One of the most important things to take away from like learning this indicator is that it will keep you out of entering trades in weak stocks that are not strong, basically are not in uptrends. And uh, that's, that's the most important thing you can take away from it. XLP. Now, uh, this is, is the consumer staples ETF looking strong on the weekly. And on the daily, we're inside, the, in between the Tengensen and Kijensen. It's sort of like an equilibrium zone, is what I call it. And it will, if it gets above Tengensen, that will give us a new buy signal. XLK is, um, you can see it found resistance here at 227.37, closed right under, got above it temporarily, but the candle itself never materialized into a bullish break above the technology. So the technology is looking kind of uh, like it might retract here. It's possible. This is a, um, what they call an ascending triangle pattern. So you get a flat level here of 227.37 that it needs to close above in order for this pattern to, you know, confirm that this is going to be a continued uptrend. Now, the good news is the ADX is moving up. Positive DI line is above negative DI line, but you want to see all of these things, uh, take everything into consideration when you're considering a long position, including trend lines very important especially horizontal ones uh which i feel are stronger you know basically more important than the diagonal ones all right um industrials xli on the daily chart looks good 
and on the weekly chart broke above that 131.59. So I like industrials. Financials look good. All right. It's hitting its head at 45.88. Uh, so it's finding resistance, um, and it's also finding resistance at the top of the tank. And so I'd hold off on financials for now. We may be getting a potential double top here in financials. I know that would not be good if it breaks down further. That would have to break under this level here too, but uh, that would be bad if that occurs. So far, so good. Uh, you'll see that there's a mixture here of what's going on on the directional movement index. It's uh, not really showing a lot of strength here. You can see the white line is dropping, so the momentum is to the downside, meaning there's no, and, and look at the crisscrossing that's taking place. Red, then green, then red again, now green again, which means indecision, basically. And so what I'd be watching to see maybe is price, or I'm sorry, this directional index breaks above these prior highs here, like the green line gets above that level. And that might make more sense to me then. B-O-N-D on the weekly chart, very bullish. This is the, the PIMCO total return ETF. So for those of you who want to be invested in ETFs, um, safe, you know, a little bit more, uh, less risk. Okay. Beta is 0.32. That's very low risk there. It, it doesn't move that much. It's up 0.27%. You can see that we had our buy signal back here on July 5th. All right, let's continue. Here's the, and let me just look at the daily. Yeah, daily looks good too. I like the daily as well for BOND. Healthcare, XLV. I had a note here from one of the um, pundits on CNBC. Let me just delete that. Liz Young recommending healthcare. Now, this one is not really looking particularly strong, as you can see. Now, one other thing I should mention the green line here, the Tenkinson, is under the red line. That's not good. That's a bearish signal right there that occurred when the crossover took place. Um, and now we've also have the price under both moving averages, but it seems to be finding a little bit of support here at this uh, level at the 152.85. So, and it's got the cloud holding up, holding it up above as well. So we'll see where this goes, but I, I would not be entering a long position in healthcare stocks temporarily. Going into next week, you never know, price might start to bounce off of these areas and break through these levels. And then we reassess the situation and then consider an entry at that point. Um, here's energy. Here's a here's a laggard right here. I mean, this one has dropped so much. Um, here's the breakdown right here from tank when it got under Tankinson. Okay, back on April 12th. Hasn't looked, I mean, basically we had a one buy signal right here on April 25th, which didn't lead to anything. And then it dropped further. Um, and we never got above the cloud since then. And that, that was back on uh, April 25th. No reason to be holding, in my opinion, guys, I, there's no reason to be holding, um, you know, this ETF, the XLE ETF. You may find some gold mines within it, though, right? If you open up a component list here, you might find some, str some strong stocks within it. You know, if I start sc screening through, let's see if I can, let's see if I can find one. Um, here, here you go. EQT Corporation looks good on the daily chart, right? But it probably doesn't look that great on the weekly. I'm going to guess. Let's, let's see. Yeah. See how it's hitting its head right there. So another thing that I do, uh, with members and I share, I do a scanner and I look for stocks that are strong on both, on both technically sound on both the weekly and the daily timeframes. And I'm looking for buy signals and I call it the, the blue cloud by scanner and if you guys want to access that and uh, to see those um those um results that pop up here's how you do it you basically i'll get back to the stocks in a few seconds you go to my page here blue cloud trading and you can become a member there's over 100 members now here is the member only videos that i do each weekend that i go over my entire portfolio um, with entries and exits. And if you click on the join button here, there are three levels that will pop up. You'll have blue cloud supporter. Now into this one, you can request a stock to be analyzed on the show. And that's, that's all you, that's the only benefit there under blue cloud trader. You can request up to two stocks for ETFs to be analyzed each week, you know, once a week, uh, on the show. And you'll also get access to those member only videos that I just talked about. Okay. And then on the with Blue Cloud Legend, which is so Blue Cloud Trader is twenty four ninety nine, Blue Cloud Legend is forty nine ninety nine. 
under this level, you can get access. You can actually request up to three stocks or ETFs be analyzed on the show. You'll be able to access some of my day trading videos. You'll be able to get, you'll also get a, a daily trade update posted in the community tab on the trades that I'm placing. There's the community tab right there. You click on that, you'll be able to see those trades each day. Um, and then also you'll also get a scan, the scan results, like I said, for uh, under Blue Cloud Legend, you'll get them daily. Under Blue Cloud Trader, you'll get them once a week. All right, so let's get back to what we were talking about. We were talking about EQT here, energy. And let's get out of that because I just wanted to show the, show you an example of how you can find stocks sometimes within these weaker sectors. But generally speaking, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be uh, jumping in them because you want the sector. And one of the things I also talk about in those weekend videos is which sector should you be invested in for the week? You know, there's going to be one or two or three, you know, of the strongest sectors that you should be considering. And that's, uh, I did that video just two days ago. So actually yesterday, I, have to, I take that back. It was on Saturday. <laughs> All right, TLT, 20-year treasury bond. Um, let's look at the weekly. This is the weekly chart, finding resistance here. But recently, breaking above the cloud. So this is when you can start thinking about entering ETFs and stocks is when you have price above. It's showing essentially that there's a, a change in the sentiment of an ETF or stock. You can see that, in fact, we do have a higher low here than this prior low. Uh, we have not broken this prior high though. So that is something I'd be watching, that $100.57 level. When it, if it breaks through that, then you can expect a move back up to 110, which is a prior level of resistance, as you can see right there. TLT has been in a decline for a, quite a while now. This is going back to over here, uh, since August 14th of 2020, when it got under the moving averages, we're talking about 2020, folks. That's a long time, four years. And uh, it looks like we had one, one specific week where price got above the cloud. You can see it right there, and it didn't last long. It, it, the very next week, it came right back under. And so, you know, you can decide whether or not it's a good idea. You know, you can enter a long position hypothetically and take maybe you take a small loss of 3.56% versus holding on to something like this where it drops, as you can see here, um, 39% in 10 months or 40% or whatever. Uh, and from this level, by the way, if you can, you know, you can also, um, from this point here, the TLT had dropped about, let's see, 43% in 2.2 years. So that's a big drop. All right. Okay. Let's go to UUP. So I like TLT overall. I like it, except that the fact that it's hitting its head on those levels that I just mentioned. Did I mention that? Did I look at the daily? Let's look at the daily time frame. So here's a daily. It's under the Tankinson and under Kijinson. So that's not a buy yet. US dollar, you know, under the moving averages, under the cloud, it's been, you know, depreciating in value. All right. We had our sell signal right here on July 3rd. There hasn't been a good reason to enter this trade since. So this is what I was talking about earlier about how this indicator can help keep you out of considering an entry position. Unless you're like day trading, in which case, you know, you can switch to five minute. I'm sure you can find, you know, like an up, like at some point you're going to find these little moves, you know, in a day where a, a stock or an ETF moves up. But if you're a swing trader, then you may want to consider, um, just using the daily and weekly charts. All right, let's look at Google now. Google on the daily chart hitting its head right at the top of the cloud. All right, so it broke through this little trend, this diagonal trend line has moved up. It's above Tenkinson and Kijinson. We got the positive DI line above negative DI line, but it's hitting its res resistance right there. So I wouldn't be entering a long position here. And here is the weekly chart for Google. It's under the Kijinson. The other Fab 7 stocks I actually hold in my portfolio and you can follow along and see when I'm going to exit those trades um, if you become a member, okay? I do cover those on the weekend videos. Apple, another stock I'm not holding right now. And yes, on the weekly chart, it is above the Tankinson, it's above the Kijinson, it's above the cloud. All of this stuff looks good. 
However, as you can see, it's finding resistance here. And so you, personally, I don't like to be entering long positions when price is hitting or coming close to resistance, which is right there, 230, 236.92. That's the level I'd be watching. And here is a daily chart that represents that. So you can see how these little yellow circles represent the levels where price had reached prior highs. Now, once it gets above that 236.92, all bets are off. I'll probably be entering a long position and uh, you can follow along with me as a member. Okay, let's now take a look at the member requests. These are some of the stocks that were requested or ETFs. Uh, FLNC, let's look at the weekly chart first. All right, so this is in the utility sector, which has been a pretty strong sector. Uh, it obviously, from a technical perspective, it's looking good, right? We've got price finally for the first week closing above the Ichimoku cloud. That's very bullish. We can see the ADX is moving up. Positive DI line is above negative DI. However, the cloud itself is still bearish. You can see that Senku Span A is still under Senku Span B. So you don't have that part of it confirming yet. Uh, you'll also need to, in my opinion, on the weekly chart, you know, you may also want to wait a little bit longer just so price gets above a prior high here. It depends on what time frame you're trading on. Let's look at the daily. On the daily time frame, it's looking more bullish, right? It broke through this, this prior high and this high, and it's a, on the shorter time frame, it looks stronger technically. Uh, one of the things I do caution against, however, is look, there's a lot of other stocks out there within the utility space that not only look great technically that you'll find the stocks that I'm holding in, in my positions, but also have positive profit margins. I think that it's important to also consider the fundamentals of a company when entering a long position. So why doesn't it make sense to consider a stock that not only looks great technically on the charts like this one does, but also has good fundamentals. And so that's another reason to maybe consider you know, I would I would hold off on this one and maybe look at some other alternatives. Uh, MAC, here's another example also where the profit margin is negative, sales growth is negative, but the technicals look good, right? So the, here's Math, the Master Rich company, it's in real estate, retail, REIT, looking good and strong on the daily time frame. It's up 3.28% on Friday. Here it is on the weekly chart. It looks like, uh, let me just check to see if it broke this level here. It did. So that high there of 1769 has been broken. And so, you know, it's gotten getting a little far away from the moving averages here, but overall I like it technically, okay? But it's probably something I personally wouldn't invest in because it's got the negative profit margin. DGS is the Wisdom Tree Emerging Markets Small Cap Dividend Fund. This is an ETF. Here's the weekly chart, looking very bullish. As you can see, it broke through these prior highs here this week. So that's very good. We're above the cloud, we get, we're above the moving averages. And then how about the daily? The daily um, up 0.15%, it's got a beta of 0.64. So it run, it moves about the, you know, 0.6%. Uh, let's, let's assume that the S&P 500, uh, the beta there is one. So the average movement of the S&P 500 on a day by day basis, all right, on the, with this ETF, it's gonna be 0.64%, all right? So it's gonna be less uh, of a movement than the SPY. Let's see, so, I mean, technically I like it. It's, um, let's see the volume here is 252,000. You know, there are other ETFs also that are, have, you may wanna look for some that have a higher volume, average volume. Uh, this is pretty low, 254. ISCF. Here's another one that has very low volume, 17,000 shares traded per day here, it looks like uh, in on Friday, and it's about 60,000 shares traded, you know, per, you know, on the average. Now this one is the, the Factor Select MSCI in, um, International Small Cap ETF. Down 0.62% on, on Friday, but it, very sound technically on the weekly chart. It is breaking to new high, you know, like this, these prior highs here. So that is good in this little high here. So it looks like it's obviously in the uptrend. And um, notice how you don't see the fundamentals here because it's an ETF. SLYG is also an ETF. This is a small cap growth ETF. 
here's the weekly chart looking bullish overall volume is 665,000 I like the fact that it's a little higher there uh, up 0.73 percent here's the daily chart holding up above Tankinson still bullish cloud I like what I'm seeing here with this too EPD enterprise products part energy sector oil and gas midstream now this one on the other hand on the daily chart you can see where it's what's happening uh, we've got three days where we're under the Tankinson finding resistance but it's also finding support at the cloud so it's sort of like you know in no man's land right now it needs to get back above these levels here and um I don't I also don't like what I'm seeing down here below the directional movement index the negative DI line is above the positive DI line and it's moving up right the ADX that's the daily how about the weekly weekly chart it's uh it seems to be sort of in a consolidation stage here you can see this little area here right so the question you have to ask yourself is how long do you want to wait for this one it's not it's obviously not moving the momentum is not strong here it's going sideways right I don't like side like if I had to choose, I'd probably want to pick a stock that is um, where the momentum is to the upside. Positive DI line is above the negative DI line. Um, the other thing you also have to take into account here with EPD is, um, let me just go back here for a second, is the fact that the sector itself, right, is oil and gas, which is not a strong sector currently. It may be in the future, but right now it's not the optimal sector to be investing in. Um, so that can also hold back stocks basically guys that's going to do it for this video i hope you enjoyed it uh one other thing i should mention if you guys like the software that i use here um let me close this for a second sorry uh if you like the software that i use it's called tc2000 and in the description section below you'll be able to find a link for it and you can get a 25 dollars coupon there's also a video link so that if you want to make your layout exactly like mine here once you become once you get the the tc2000 software um there's a video with instructions on how to do that that i have linked in the description area that's going to do it for this video hope you enjoyed it and have a great rest of the weekend guys